so wrong for so Without the love that you give, I was wrong. Oh, so wrong. Hey, uh, I'm currently reading Marcus J. Borg and John Dominic Crozen's book, The Last Week, a day by day account of Jesus' final week in Jerusalem. I'm about a third of the way through it, and I'm enjoying it and learning from it. Among the many things that Borg and Crozen uh, discuss in the last week is what has come to be called the mini apocalypse in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, the mini apocalypse comprises the 13th chapter of the Gospel and it opens with Jesus responding to one of his disciples admiring the quote wonderful stones and wonderful buildings of the temple. Jesus tells the disciple that the temple will be destroyed quote not one stone shall be left upon another. The scene then moves to the Mount of Olives, just opposite the temple, Mark tells us, uh, when Jesus was asked by several of the apostles privately about when these things, including without limitation, the destruction of the temple, were going to happen. Uh, the response, which goes on for about 32 verses or so, um, includes many of the elements that tend to appear in the Bible's apocalyptic literature, namely wars and rumors of wars, uh, persecution of believers, uh, various signs in the heavens, for example, the sun stops shining and the moon is darkened, stars fall, that sort of thing. Um, the whole thing culminates in Jesus returning, quote, with great power and glory, unquote, to gather up his people. Uh, there are lengthier versions of the mini, mini apocalypse uh, that appear in the 24th chapter of Matthew and the 21st chapter of Luke. My attention was especially drawn to Mark 13:30, which has Jesus saying, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. The author of Matthew's Gospel has Jesus say the same thing in Matthew 24, 34, and it also appears in Luke 21, 32. Now, Assuming arguendo, the historicity of this, um, it seems clear that Jesus and many in the Christian communities of the first century CE believed that the end of the world and Jesus' second coming were imminent. They would happen within the lifetimes of those alive at the time. Uh, we see this belief articulated by those in the first century Christian communities in, for example, 1 Corinthians 7.29, where Paul says, the time is short and 1 Thessalonians 4.17, where Paul talks about we who are alive and remain when Jesus returns. In the last chapter of the book of Revelations, three times the author has Jesus say that his return is imminent. In Mark's mini-apocalypse and the parallel passages in Matthew and Luke, Jesus is shown being rather specific about the timing of all this. This generation will not pass away until all of these things take place. Of course, the members of the generation that would have heard Jesus speak those words have been dead for almost two millennia now, and they died without all these things taking place. I've never heard or read a believer's explanation of Mark 13.30 and the parallel passages in Matthew and Luke that make sense. Truth be told, I haven't heard many explanations of the passage from believers at all. What came to mind as I reread Mark's mini apocalypse was Deuteronomy 18:22, which says, quote, "When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is a thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him." Uh, this, according to Deuteronomy 18:21 and 22, is the test to determine whether a prophecy is from God or not. If it doesn't happen, God didn't say it. So where does that leave poor Jesus and his prophecy about that generation not passing away until all those things, including his own return, took place? Applying the Deuteronomy 18 test, it seems one must conclude 
that the prophecy was not from God. Hey, this is a follow-up to my video entitled, Jesus Was Wrong. Um, thanks to everyone who participated in the discussion of that video. There were nearly 400 text comments um, and several video responses. Since I put out a particular invitation to them, I'm especially grateful to the many believers who shared their understanding of Mark 13.30 and the parallel passages in Matthew and Luke. Um, before I get to the responses, I want to do two things. First, summarize the argument I made in the Jesus Was Wrong video, and second, quickly run through the New Testament passages that I believe establish beyond any reasonable doubt that many, if not most, perhaps even all, of the members of the early first century Christian communities believed that the second coming of Jesus was imminent and would occur within their lifetimes. Okay, so first the upshot of my argument in the Jesus Was Wrong video. Mark 13.30 has Jesus say in reference to the series of events he describes in that chapter, a description that has come to be called a mini-apocalypse, um, a series of events, I should note, that includes Jesus, quote, coming in the clouds, unquote, with his angels to collect his, quote, elect, unquote. Uh, Mark 13.30 has Jesus say about all this, quote, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Um, I argued that if one applies to Mark 13.30 the prophetic accuracy test articulated in Deuteronomy 18.22, Mark 13.30 fails to qualify as a prophecy from God because it didn't come true. All those things didn't happen before the members of the generation that would have heard Jesus speak those words died. Second, uh, there can be no doubt that many, seems likely most, of the members of the first century Christian communities, the primitive church, as it's sometimes called, believed that Jesus' return to earth was imminent, that it would take place within their own lifetimes. Um, the Gospels, at least the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, indicate that Jesus believed this too, or at least that those writing about Jesus put the belief in his voice in the gospel stories. Here's a list of the relevant passages. Matthew 16, 28, Jesus speaking, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Uh, Matthew 10, 23, Jesus speaking again, But whenever they persecute you in this city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you shall not finish going through the cities of Israel before or until the Son of Man comes. Um, the sense of imminence behind that claim really comes into relief when one recalls what a small piece of real estate Jesus was saying would not be exhausted before he returned. Matthew twenty-three thirty-six. Jesus speaking, Truly I say to you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Uh, Matthew twenty-four thirty-four. Jesus speaking, Truly I say to you, this generation shall not pass away until all these things take place. Matthew twenty-six sixty-four. Jesus under arrest, addressing the high priest Caiaphas, You will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Who will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven? Caiaphas, the high priest from 18 to 36 CE. Mark 9, 1, Jesus speaking, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Mark 13, 30, which we've been discussing, Truly I say to you, this generation shall not pass away until all these things take place. Mark 14.62, Jesus speaking to the high priest, You shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds. Um, Luke 20, uh, I'm sorry, Luke 9.27, Jesus speaking, uh, But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Luke 21.32, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. 1 Corinthians 7.29, the time is short. 1 Thessalonians 4.16-17, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven, and we who are alive and remain 
shall be caught up together with the risen dead to meet the Lord in the air. James 5, 8 to 9, You too be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. Now, the language James uses there is quite striking when one recalls that James is named as one of the four disciples who spoke privately with Jesus in Mark 13, where Jesus talks about, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Uh, clearly, James believed that time was upon him and his contemporaries. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand. Um, in the epistles that bear Peter's name, written as early as 60 CE, uh, one sees indications that there were increasing concerns within the church about the fact that Jesus had not yet returned. In the third chapter of Second Peter, we see the author addressing these concerns. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Um, in his excellent article, When Prophecy Fails and Faith Persists, a theoretical overview, sociologist Lorne L. Dawson discusses the range of adaptational strategies used by religious groups to cope with prophetic failure. Uh, Dr. Dawson notes that among the things crucial to such a religious group's survival is a, quote, quick, confident, and resourceful reaction of the leadership, unquote, to rationalize the failure. Uh, in 2 Peter 3.9, we see an example of this. Jesus hasn't failed to return. It's merely a delay, and one inspired by his patient desire to see all come to repentance. I'll return to Dr. Dawson's invaluable article a little later. For now, I've put a link to it to the right of the screen. Uh, Revelation 1, 1 to 7, written in or about 96 CE, which talks about the things which must shortly take place. The time is near. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. And then there are the three uh, statements of Jesus from Revelation 22, in which he talks about coming quickly. One should also note the very frequent use of you and your in Mark 13, 23 times in 32 verses. Jesus is clearly depicted telling his disciples about events he means to say they and their contemporaries will witness. There are other passages one could cite, but it would be cumulative to the point already demonstrated. The first century Christian communities believed Jesus' return was imminent, that it would occur before the contemporary generation died out. To expand a bit on what I said in my Jesus Was Wrong video, if one applies the Deuteronomy 18.22 test to these predictions, one is compelled to conclude by the Bible's own standard that these predictions were not of God. They were things which the Lord did not speak. And it's all just a little bit of history repeating. Okay, continuing. Um, so how do believers deal with this problem of failed prophecy in Mark 13.30 and elsewhere? Uh, in a variety of ways, as we'll see, it's important to keep in mind that believers have been dealing with prophetic failures um, since the earliest days of Christianity. Yet, Christianity has survived and thrived. Um, as Dr. Dawson notes in When Prophecy Fails and Faith Persists, a theoretical overview, unfulfilled millennial expectations didn't destroy Christianity in its apostolic infancy. Uh, Christianity gradually reinterpreted the apocalyptic elements of its emerging theology and not only survived, but thrived. Um, Dr. Dawson discusses in his excellent article um, a medley of reasons for this, quote, an array of adaptational strategies, as he puts it. And the phenomenon is not unique to Christianity. Um, two adaptational strategies seem primary. Uh, one, successful rationalization, and two, a religious group's possession and presentation of a broad and sophisticated ideological system of which prophecy is merely one component. Dr. Dawson argues, I think correctly, quote, successful rationalization 
is the most important factor contributing to the maintenance of beliefs and the survival of a religious group in the wake of a prophetic failure. Such rationalizations take a number of forms, they even combine forms, um, including, without limitation, the spiritualization of the prophecy, uh, characterizing the failure as a test of faith, casting the failure as human error, and or blaming others for the failure. Uh, we saw an example of one of these in part two when we discussed 2 Peter 3.9 where the writer addressed emerging concerns in the first century Christian communities about Jesus' failure to return to date. Um, the writer offered a version of the test of faith rationalization. Jesus hasn't returned yet because he's being patient, quote, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance, unquote. Once the apparent prophetic failure was cast in terms of this test of faith, Peter quickly went on to say, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. A bit earlier in the same chapter, Peter uses the blaming others a rationalization. Have a look at 2 Peter 3, 3 to 4, where he talks about, quote, mockers who will come with their mocking to ask, where is the promise of his coming? It's not that the prophecy of Jesus' return has failed. Rather, it's the mockers who are, quote, following after their own lusts, unquote, who are upsetting believers and trying to sow doubt among them. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The author of Second Peter would have fit in quite easily among many believers here on YouTube, for example, who make frequent use of the blaming others rationalization. So the adaptational strategy of rationalization has been employed for almost 2,000 years. It's become part of Christianity's DNA, as it were. Uh, no one should be surprised to see it employed as often as it is. Um, with respect to a religious group's possession and presentation of a broad and sophisticated ideological system, Christianity offers its adherence, to borrow Dr. Dawson's words, a broader and more complex set of beliefs than merely prophecy that frame a comprehensive worldview, sense of mission, and collective identity. Uh, Dr. Dawson continues, quote, prophecy in these groups is part of a denser continuum of cosmologically significant beliefs and activities that can embrace and contain contradictions. In other words, there's much, much more at stake for the believer than prophetic disconfirmation. Uh, as a commentator on one Christian website I looked at said, after describing his struggle with what to believe vis-a-vis uh, -vis eschatology and biblical prophecy, quote, God is bigger than my eschatological beliefs. The final question should be, what belief system should I hold to that will help me best devote myself to the service of the Lord Jesus Christ? So the cognitive dissonance brought on by prophetic disconfirmation is subsumed into a renewed commitment to the broader mission and beliefs of the Christian faith. Uh, with its broad and sophisticated ideological system and fairly comprehensive worldview, Christianity allows its adherents to handle a certain amount of disconfirmation and contradiction, with some adherents simply denying that either exist by rationalizing them away. As Dr. Dawson concludes, the resilience displayed by religious groups in the face of prophetic failure suggests that the level of dissonance experienced by insiders is less than imagined by outsiders. So believers tend to successfully manage and or adapt uh, to a degree of cognitive dissonance. And some, as Dr. Dawson quite correctly notes, don't even acknowledge the existence of disconfirming evidence. Um, I can't do Dr. Dawson's article justice here, uh, as I did in part two. I've put a link to the right of the screen where one can access it in its entirety. It's well worth reading, and I strongly recommend it to your attention. The three categories into which most, not all, but most believers' responses to my Jesus Was Wrong video fell are one, silly stuff, uh, two, the preterist perspective, and three, the futurist perspective. Now common to all of them is a recognition that if Jesus meant exactly what Mark 13 has him predicting, the prediction fails the Deuteronomy 1822 test. So 
believers tend to offer rationalizations in support of the proposition that Jesus' prediction did not fail, that it meant something other than what it says. Um, I'll address the three categories seriatim. Uh, some believers' attempts at rationalization with respect to Mark 13 in general and Mark 13.30 in particular were silly on their face. Um, for example, first, one Christian wrote, quote, the chapter says nothing about his return. Apparently, this believer never read Mark 13, 26 to 27, which clearly describes Jesus' return. Uh, in Mark 13, 34 to 36, Jesus is depicted analogizing what he's described to a man who goes away on a journey, leaves his slaves in charge of his house, and the man could return at any moment. Um, the chapter, Mark 13, says nothing about his return? <coughs> Second, another Christian wrote, people misunderstand Mark 13 and think Christ is saying the world is going to end in the first century. But that's not what he was discussing. As you know, no one knows the hour, not even the angels in heaven. Several believers offered similar responses. The bit about not knowing the hour is a reference to Mark 13:32 in a parallel passage in Matthew. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Of course, there's nothing in that passage that excludes the plain meaning of Mark 13.30, Jesus telling his disciples that the generation alive when he was speaking would see the events he had predicted, including, without limitation, his second coming. All these things. He wasn't telling them the precise day or hour. Um, however, he very much was telling them to be ready, lest he come suddenly and find them asleep. So... <coughs> Okay, on to part four, where I'll finish up my analysis of believers' responses. Thanks. Okay, continuing, uh, we're still in silly stuff. Third, several Christians suggested that in Mark 13.30, we don't encounter Jesus speaking precisely, He's speaking imprecisely. As one Christian put it, it was Jesus speaking freely among friends, not English class, um, Sean M. P. W. H., one of the video respondents, put it this way. The problem really stems from the way Jesus uses language. He'll use language just the way we do, and that is we use exaggeration. We use hyperbole. With all due respect to the people who wrote and said these and similar things, I must say they strike me as the silliest of the silly responses. In Mark 13, we encounter the purported savior of humankind speaking with his disciples about one of the most, if not the most, ominous matter imaginable, namely the end of the world and his return to gather and save his people. He's telling them that they're going to face persecution. Some of them will even be executed. Horrible things are on the horizon. And he sternly notes, quote, Behold, I have told you everything in advance. But some Christians would have us believe that in this discourse, Jesus is speaking imprecisely. It's not English class, after all. As if English class would be a more significant occasion than telling people about the imminent series of events leading to the end of the world. One wonders why Christians who make these silly claims would take seriously anything Jesus said if this, the mini-apocalypse in Mark 13, can be chalked up to mere exaggeration and hyperbole. The author of Mark has Jesus telling his disciples, Be on alert! Some believers here respond, ah, Jesus is just talking, that's all. Okay, moving on to number two, the preterist perspective. Um, preterism is a Christian eschatological view that holds that many, if not all of the events that passages such as Mark 13 have Jesus predicting, have already taken place. The prophecies were fulfilled within the generation of Jesus' contemporaries. Um, specifically, preterists see the fulfillment of passages such as Mark 13 in the Roman destruction of the Jewish temple and Jerusalem in 70 CE. There are different varieties of preterists who disagree with and among one another um, about a variety of things, but that's beyond the scope of this video. What is relevant 
is that many believers' responses um, suggested that preterism solves the problem presented by Mark 13 and its parallel passages. Um, preterism's plus is that it recognizes the plain meaning of Mark 13:30. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Preterists don't waste time pretending Jesus' words meant something other than what they obviously mean. That is, that Jesus was predicting all of the things he had described would take place before the generation of his contemporaries died off. So, a big thumbs up for preterism on this account. However, preterists go wrong uh, with respect to Jesus' return as it's described in Mark 13 and its parallels in Matthew and Luke. In short, they spiritualize the prophecy of Jesus' return. Uh, Mark 13, 26 says that those around at the time of Jesus' return will, quote, see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Uh, the Greek word translated see is optonomai, I think I pronounced that correctly, which means to look at, to behold. The parallel in Matthew 24 describes it almost identically, adding, for just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Uh, the parallel passage in Luke 21 describes it similarly. So what's going on here? Why do preterists spiritualize this prophecy? Well, if Jesus meant exactly what Mark and the others have him predicting, about his return, uh, the prophecy failed, and Jesus doesn't pass the Deuteronomy 18.22 test. Um, preterists use the rationalization of spiritualization of the prophecy to avoid this. As one believer put it, quote, if the various flavors of preterism are right, then so is Jesus. Um, therefore, according to preterists, Jesus returned in 70 CE in, as one believer put it, quote, judgment upon apostate Jerusalem. Uh, specifically, he came back, as another believer put it, uh, quote, in the Roman army that destroyed the temple and Jerusalem in order to bring the sacrificial system to an end. In this construction, the clouds become symbolic of divine judgment. Ironically, preterists end up sounding like the people Matthew has Jesus warning the disciples against. If therefore they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go forth. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. You can add, you know, behold, he is in the Roman army. Why? Because as quoted earlier, just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So preterists use the rationalization of spiritualization of the prophecy in order to avoid the obvious. That is, Jesus was wrong. His prophecy failed. Moving on to number three, the futurist perspective. Um, while preterism is guilty of rationalizing Mark 1330's failed prophecy by spiritualizing it, uh, the preterist eschatological viewpoint is benign. By contrast, the futurist's eschatology is comprised of crazy and incendiary ideas. It's no exaggeration to say that they are probably among the most potentially dangerous civilization-threatening notions imaginable. The overwhelming majority of TV shows about Bible prophecy emerge from the futurist perspective, and books espousing futurist eschatology can fill many, many bookshelves. Um, just the Left Behind series alone, with approximately 42 million books sold, has proven what big business this stuff can be. Okay, continuing, uh, this is the final part of the four-part follow-up to my Jesus Was Wrong video. We're discussing the futurist perspective. Um, fundamental to this perspective is the claim that Jesus references to this generation cannot refer to the generation of Jesus contemporaries. Um, futurists insist that it refers to a subsequent generation. 
uh, over the centuries, futurists have often claimed that it was their own generation, and many of today's futurists are no exception. As one believer wrote in response to my original video, quote, these things, the things enumerated in Mark 13, are unfolding right now. Contemporary futurists have a number of ways to push this generation out of Jesus' time and into our own. Among them is the notion that the founding of the modern state of Israel in 1948 constituted a prophetic super sign, if you will, a key that unlocks the true meaning of Mark 13 and its parallels. Um, the fact that there isn't a word in Mark 13 or its parallels about a modern state of Israel doesn't deter futurists in the least. Um, using various rationalizations, futurists historicize a bit of the text in order to shoehorn a reference to Israel into Mark 13. The part they historicize is this, Mark 13, 28 to 29, Jesus speaking, now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near, right at the door. This passage, many futurists assert, has Jesus talking about Israel being established in 1948. Uh, Hal Lindsey, one of the great charlatans of futurist eschatology, declared in his book, The Late Great Planet Earth, quote, the figure of speech fig tree has been a historic symbol of national Israel. When the Jewish people, after nearly 2,000 years of exile, under relentless persecution, became a nation again on 14 May 1948, the fig tree put forth its first leaves. Uh, this, Mr. Lindsay asserted, started the countdown to Armageddon. In fact, Mr. Lindsay published another book entitled The 1980s, Countdown to Armageddon, in which he claimed that the 80s might be, quote, the last decade of history, unquote. Why? Well, a biblical generation was thought to be 40 years. Israel was founded in 1948, add 40 years, and voila, you have 1988. Hal Lindsey wrote, quote, within 40 years or so of 1948, all these things could take place. Of course, here we are 20 years out, and all these things have not taken place. Um, as Dr. Barbara R. Rossing, professor of New Testament at the Lutheran School of Theology out in Chicago, notes in her excellent book, The Rapture Exposed, The Message of Hope in the Book of Revelation, quote, Lindsay backed off from that statement as 1988 approached, and it became clear that the rapture and the end of the world were not happening uh, within 40 years of Israel's founding, contrary to the original prophecy. Like so many futurists, Lindsay is a master of revision. Uh, Dr. Rossing notes, quote, his followers have to buy his revised editions to keep up with the latest biblical scenarios. More importantly, neither Mark 13 nor its parallels have Jesus identifying the fig tree as Israel. There's nothing in the New Testament mandating the restoration of Israel as a state as a condition precedent to the end of the world. While Mr. Lindsay and other futurists assert that the fig tree has always been a national symbol of Israel, there's absolutely no support for that claim. Nevertheless, it's been a staple of the dispensationalist brand of futurism for some time. And as Dr. Rossing notes, people like Hal Lindsay have popularized the notion. Another significant element of the futurist perspective is the belief that the Jewish temple must be rebuilt on its traditional site in Jerusalem, a site on which the Muslim Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque currently stand. Earlier, I noted that the futurist eschatology is comprised of some crazy and incendiary ideas, potentially civilization-threatening notions. Um, the dream of rebuilding the temple is one of those ideas. Uh, lest anyone think that this notion merely exists in the minds of some religious zealots, visit the website of the Temple Institute. 
an organization that is working for, quote, the fulfillment of the biblical prophecies that promise the reestablishment of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, is seeking to rekindle the desire and yearning for the rebuilding of the Holy Temple and to help to prepare as much as possible for the actual rebuilding. The Temple Institute uh, has employed people to prepare the various temple vessels and priestly garments according to the meticulous instructions in the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, in December 2007, the Institute announced the completion of the High Priest's headplate in accordance with Exodus 28, 36 to 37. The Institute also announced, quote, we have begun work on architectural blueprints for the Third Temple, including cost projection, modern supplies, electricity, plumbing, computers, etc. Uh, much of this work is bankrolled by American Christians committed to the futurist perspective. Why is this incendiary and potentially civilization threatening? As Rod Dreyer notes in an article entitled Red Heifer Days, that appeared in National Review Online back in April 2002, the whole temple rebuilding project puts Christian, Jewish, and Muslim apocalyptic visions on a collision course. Mr. Dreyer points out, quote, Muslim leaders would see an attempt by Jews to take over the Temple Mount as a sign of the Islamic apocalypse. Um, as of the publication of Mr. Dreyer's article, there had been, quote, at least four actual plots to clear the space where the temple had stood. Some of them went surprisingly high into the Israeli army and police. Unshakable faith in prophetic visions makes the art of political compromise impossible. As Dr. Timothy Weber, then dean of the Northern Baptist Theological Seminary, told Mr. Dreyer, quote, there is no way to negotiate these ideas if you believe that this is in the prophetic cards, that this is history before it happens, that this is how God is going to manipulate events to bring about the final phase of human history. Then you cannot negotiate land for peace or anything else. I've put a link to the right of the screen with Mr. Dreyer's article from National Review Online. I've also put a link to information about uh, Gershom Gorenberg's excellent book, The End of Days, Fundamentalism and the Struggle for the Temple Mount, which is both fascinating and chilling. Of course, the only real reason futurists advance these sorts of ideas is because they refuse to acknowledge the plain meaning of Mark 1330 and its parallels that Jesus' prediction pertained to the generation of his contemporaries, a prediction that failed, and therefore by the Bible's own standard, was not from God. Another maneuver a uh, futurist attempt is to point out that the word translated generation uh, can mean age or nation or something other than generation. Um, I checked 18 English language translations of Mark 13.30. 16 of 18 translate the word as generation. The other two, namely the New Century Version and the New Life Version, render the word, quote, the people of this time and, quote, the people of this day. Not one of the believers who claim that there's a translation issue here uh, could show a textual reason to translate it any differently than just about every English language translation does. There is no such reason. I've demonstrated that Jesus' prediction in Mark 13.30 failed and by the biblical standard could not have been from God. Thanks a lot.